Hey, everybody. Welcome to Breakfast All Day. Christy Alonzo. Um, it is in theaters and it's on HBO Max. Even if Denis Villeneuve would rather maybe you not watch it on HBO Max. Tough. He doesn't get to say anymore. Uh, Dune. <laughs> it's Dune. It's the new uh, uh, film adaptation of uh, Frank Herbert's legendary novel, previously brought to the screen by David Lynch. And this is... Um, pretty much a movie that lets you know uh, that it's going to be the first half of two. Um, but, you know, how if two gets made, kind of depends on how one goes. So uh, what, let's see what we think. I think two will get made. Okay. I think enough people are interested in this and are going to respond favorably to it that you're going to get more Dune. Tune. T <laughs> Tune. U-N-E. They got to call it that, right? Tune. Um, so... The year is 10,191, and my planet Arrakis is beautiful, and the sun is low, and it's Dune. It's the, it's the book Dune, um, which I've never read, because I guess it's like 900 pages long, yeah, and it's very complicated. Either. But I also, I had not seen the David Lynch Dune going into this. I've, I've watched it since, and I'm uh, so glad I did, because it's batshit. Yeah. <laughs> It's every bit a David Lynch movie. Mm. Um, it was it was widely derided when it came out, but I dug it. We had fun watching it here. Um, yeah, I, I watched it. Yeah, we should do like a whole other Lynch Dune segment sometime. We should. I, I would I love that. <laughs> Let's do that because um, like when Matt comes back, because I yes, think he probably yes. has seen that Lynch Dune at some point, sure and uh, it was fun. So um, yes, this is set in the far far future where the most valuable resource in the universe is spice, the spice melange. And it only exists on the desert planet of Arrakis. And so over the years, various houses have come and colonized it to plunder it and mine the spice. And at the beginning, it is the House of Harkonnen, but the emperor tells a House of Atreides to go in there and like restore peace and get profit going back up again. Um, Oscar Isaac is the head of the House of Atreides and Timothy Chalamet, because it is Timothy Chalamet week here at breakfast all day. Um, Timothy Chalamet is his son, Paul, who is this messianic figure. Um, Paul's Would mom- he be the Kwisatz Haderach? You can, <laughs> he, um, well, you know, they don't call him by his name <laughs> in <laughs> this, in this, I didn't mean to do that. Even they don't call him by his name in this one, the, the name they call him in the, you know, the name he's known by many names. That's it, they call um, him a couple things in this one, but, but they don't get to any of them yet. The because that's all going to be in part two. I guess. Right. So, um, he is this messianic figure and he has these like premonitions and these dreams and he has the psychic ability that he inherited from his mom who is part of a coven of witches um his mom is rebecca ferguson um so he wants to go to arrakis and prove himself he's had these visions of this beautiful woman and she's really intriguing played by zendaya who gets to say like two lines total in this movie i'm guessing there's got to be a whole lot more zendaya in part two i'm thinking there would have to be yeah <laughs> right and so um it's basically just a whole bunch of palace intrigue about, you know, who's in charge of the, of the planet and how does Paul's place in the universe evolve as he um, begins to understand his purpose and his sense of self. I saw this in IMAX oh. and I am so glad I saw it in IMAX. I went to the IMAX headquarters in Playa Vista and I wasn't really particularly looking forward to it. I was like, oh, it's going to be a slog. Like, yay, it's not that far from me, but uh, <laughs> it's two and a half hours long. And so, and I hadn't read the book, and so I had no great excitement about it. I was over and over again, completely overwhelmed by just the technical prowess on display here. And I mean, Greg Frazier shot it, the Hans Zimmer score, the sound design, the costume design, like every bit of this from a technical perspective is stunning and it has real weight to it and real substance. And we review so many movies here and so many of them are blockbusters. And I did a whole series of Marvel movie, you know, podcasts. I like a lot of those big blockbusters, but there's like a, a glossy kind of CGI emptiness to those spectacles that we here we don't have that here. This feels like a real movie. This feels substantive. This has heft. And I, I know Alonzo, you saw it differently, and you'll talk about that in a sec. Um, 
If you can, if you feel comfortable doing it, if there's an IMAX theater near you, please go see it on the biggest screen you can because Denis Villeneuve shot so much of it in IMAX. So to see it projected that way is totally overwhelming. Having said that, I felt nothing. I felt nothing emotionally. I felt no connection to these characters. I was dazzled visually over and over again, like over and over again. I'm like, holy shit, that's gorgeous. Oh my God, that's impressive. Wow, I... I've never seen anything like that before or, you know, Rebecca Ferguson with whatever the costume is that has like the, the jewelry attached to the veil. Like it's just, mm. a, it's a stunning, stunning film. But as far as like character development, <laughs> as far as like actual emotion, as far as feeling engaged and caring about what happens within all of the palace intrigue and all the one-upsmanship, I, you know, it's a chilly Denis Villeneuve film like Arrival, you know, although Sicario is pretty badass, but Arrival a lot of his films has some human beings in it. Though. Does it? Arrival has, I think, yeah. I mean, yeah, you care about Amy Adams and her <laughs> inner life. It's not and, just about talking about her dry erase board. Yes. <laughs> if I could talk to the aliens. Um, right. so I know you saw it very differently, though. So what was your experience? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, there's a lot of craft going on here. You're right. There's some, some really extraordinary visuals and some, you know, like, just like just some of the, the the ships that people use, whether it's those the 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 ornithopters with like the dragonfly wings or like the one that has the big balloon things kind of floop out of the top, I thought was you know, really amazing. But I, I having just watched the Lynch one and this one, and not having read the novel, I keep wondering: is there something about the novel that is just that has nothing to do with how these films get made is the appeal of the novel, the palace intrigue and stuff. And the movies keep trying to make this exciting because there's so much emphasis on like the fights and the poisonings and the, you know, the, 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 the flying darts and all that kind of stuff. And it, and that's all fine. And some of it's really exciting, but you know, you're right. You don't know, you don't get to know any of these people. You don't really get a feel for any of them as like, what they want for themselves apart from what, what they need for the house of Harkonnen and the honor of the Bene Gesserit and all the, all of that stuff. It's like, give me a moment, just, just like some hesitancy or desire or anything, because that's what gets lost for me. Um, and then I, granted, I saw this on a television. I was originally gonna have to see it on my laptop so that I got to see it on TV was an upgrade. Um, <laughs> I was dying for a color, any color in this movie, it is so fucking gray. Like I've and seen orange, white... a lot of orange. Oh, some orange in the desert, yeah. <laughs> but like before they even get to the orangey desert planet, everybody's wearing black all the time. All these like long passageways and rooms are dark and black. And it's I, I've seen black and white movies that felt more like little felt less monochromatic than this. So you mm -hmm. know, maybe it maybe gigantic. Yeah, it pops. I know, like it does. I, I I can't. I can't see Tati's playtime if it's not in 70. So I understand <laughs> the notion of like, there's certain movies that you just have to see big, but seeing it on TV, I was sort of like, oh, it's so dreary. And then on top of it, I don't care about no. the, the folks. And, you know, the Lynch version does, tries to cram the entire book into one movie. And so it becomes the like longest previously on Homeland you've ever seen because it's nothing but like, <laughs> here's a new character and here's a plot thing and here's a new character and here's a plot thing. Um, you know, you're told that the, the narrator is telling you who's constantly narrating it so we know what's going on. Virginia you know, Madsen. Virginia Madsen tells us that <laughs> that that Paul and Sean Young's character have fallen in love and we see them smooch. You're like, okay, great. They never had a conversation, but I guess they're in love now. Let's move on because we yeah. got to race to the end of this book. And, mm -hmm. so, and so I figure, okay, well, this one he's dividing it in two surely we'll get to like pause and take in some character and some no it's the it's got the same i think plotting and character issues that the lynch one has which is like it all just feels kind of raced through for me so um yeah i i i i admire a lot of what's going on in this movie but it didn't it didn't hit me on a dramatic level hardly at all i i think the book i suspect operates with as you know you understand you're reading this metaphor about like resource management and the environment and colonization and you know all of that stuff and those are those ideas are all in here but but it's all idea and no you know 
dramatis personae. Yeah. Um, speaking to the the color scheme at play here, um, the the DP Greg Fraser, um, I think that's a, a lot of his sensibility is, is that look. He shot. Um, he shot Rogue One, he shot Bright Star, he shot several episodes of The Mandalorian and also Vice, which is very different for him. But there's like a like a soft kind of like hazy neutral to the look of a lot of his films that exists here, um, which for me added to a sense of mystery, added to a sense of of, of tension and just curiosity. So for me, it worked. Um, there's also blue, blue is a color because <laughs> the Fremen have super blue eyes. Um, so there is that. Um, Timothy Chalamet, I thought was really good in this though, because um, so much is projected onto him, so many expectations. Yeah. And he he finds an, an, an inner life and like a yearning and a desire to assert himself on his own terms. And um, and it's interesting to think about how he and Kyle McLaughlin were mm-hmm. both about the same age. Oh, wow. When they, they're both about 25 years old. But- and t- <laughs> Timmy always seems so boyish and youthful. Yeah, and Kyle McLaughlin's looks- like a full grown ass man. <laughs> yeah, t- t- Timothy still looks 14. Um, and, and I mean, and, and like the, they're they're leaning into that. Like you, the first shot of him in the film, he's like shirtless. You're like, oh, you're a you're a wee slip of a lad. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's it's a weird, it's a tough role because like the whole movie is like, oh, is he the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? Surprise, he is. You know, and so you, 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 it's hard to kind of imbue somebody like that with like flaws or, you know, just sort of a, a, a vulnerability, you know, it, the, the, the kind of humanity that you would normally need to play. But yeah, he does at least play it not like, not with the sort of a- arrogance of someone who is to the manner born, but of someone who understands that he has not quite yet fulfilled his destiny. I will say that the line, and grandfather bought, fought bulls for sport is going to be his, I wanted to, I wanted to go to the Tosi station, you know. <laughs> Um, it's an incredible supporting cast besides that those we mentioned yes. Oscar Isaac um, Stellan Skarsgård I did not realize I was watching Stellan Skarsgård as what he's the Baron really he, he's the oh, big wow. dude Oh I know, God. I know. Um, Jason Momoa is in this, and if there's any shred of humor, yes, he's from it. him. Thank God him. he yes. shows up, and Phew. he's like kind of swaggering and charismatic because, like, this it's a it's a very serious movie. This yeah. he takes the mythology of Dune very seriously. Um, Josh Charlotte Brolin's Rampling. in it. Javier Bardem. Charlotte it's Rampling. An, Charlotte Rampling. Yeah, I couldn't figure out who that was at first under the because you see her under a veil at first, and I'm like. Is that Kate Blanchett? Because she has that beautifully deep. I thought she was. Voice. I thought it was Glenda Jackson, actually. <laughs> oh, but no, it's, it's Dave Bautista's in it. Yep. David Dasmalkian, who also is unrecognizable because, like, Polka did they bleach man, his yeah. eyebrows or do they shave him off? I finally I figured out who he was, but it took me once or twice. I was like, oh, I know that guy. Who is that guy? You know? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's um. Again, I really do think our experiences are as different as they are based on how we saw it. And I totally understand why you saw it the way you did. I do. I yeah, do. and I and I acknowledge that that's just where we are right now with this thing. And and it will go on the list of things I know I need to see again in the proper format when the time comes that I can do that. So yeah. yes. Um. So I'm curious to hear if you, if you guys do indeed watch it. How will you watch it? Will you watch it at home because you can? Will you go to a theater? Like, will this be the event that you finally feel like it's time mm. to go to the theater um it is playing everywhere i'm sure a thousand times a day <laughs> <laughs> so um and you know it did not feel like two and a half hours to me oh it felt like two and a half hours. yeah <laughs> <laughs> did it the bit. spice melange you. coursing through your veins but uh, right, so I, we, didn't, we didn't even get to fade rotha yet you know so like who knows well, oh right yeah the sting character isn't yeah. even in this one right right so many good memes so many good like shirtless sting memes <laughs> in from the original dune yeah we should go back and, and for sure rewatch I, I, did like, I, I did like the vision of the harkonnen here in that like because for lynch it was like oh they're gingers and here he yeah. actually sort of makes them kind of something separate and different and i liked the focus on the Fremen because then it, it 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 kind of takes away from this being sort of a white savior movie mm-hmm. and more of a critique of colonization. And also given when Colonial. this comes out, I know this was not necessarily the intention in the book because it was so long ago, but like seeing all the, the women on Arrakis dressed in what looked like burkas. 
you know, well, feels to me like an indictment of like, you know, Western interference in the Middle East, you know, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Or they're living 20 in the years. middle of the desert and that's just what everybody wears to keep I shit guess. out of their eyes. Because the men are all wearing headdresses too. I mean, it's, I guess it just felt know. like it felt like you could interpret it as a pointed statement okay. on the war in Iraq or not. <laughs> if, that, if that is your read, that is your read. I, I mean, I'm sure I get major Vietnam vibes from uh -huh. the fact this movie came out in the mid 60s. The book came out in the mid 60s. So sure, it's certainly possible. You could, you could apply that, that anger about that dynamic to various sure. places around the globe. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm saying 8.8. .8. I was really, really blown away by it. And I, I'm glad that I, I saw it project the way I did. I said 6.8 based on one viewing on television. <laughs> I, I reserve the right to upgrade if seeing it on the big screen makes a big difference, which it may well do. Yes, I'm very curious to hear that. So our numbers are 7.8. Do is out there for your consumption. Yes. In the world. Indeed. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on the social media at BeFast All Day. Um, you can also subscribe to our Patreon page at, at uh, patreon.com slash BeFast All Day. Watch videos like this with no commercial interruption. Enjoy our recaps of shows like Apple TV's The Morning Show and coming up soon, Hawkeye. And uh, of course, you know, once a month, we let our subscribers choose a classic film for us to review you, one that we haven't talked about on the show before. And for October, uh, they have selected Julia DeCorno's Raw, uh, the film that she made before Titan. It is currently streaming on Netflix. And if you're a subscriber, you'll get to see us talk about it next week. So become one, won't you? Uh, have a good week, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.